Welcome to Truth Jihad Radio. I'm Kevin Barrett, looking for the truth about what's really happening in today's crazy world. We're moving today to Pakistan, where the recent elections have gotten international attention. It looks like Imran Khan has uh, won, or at least he's claiming victory. The Western press is not terribly favorable to him, and the Western press t- seems to make the Pakistani military out to be the bad guys, and the uh, relatively corrupt civilian types are, are better in their view, which makes me suspect that the reality might be precisely the opposite. But here to explain is uh, Zaid Hamid. He's with Brass Tax, which is uh, kind of a think tank and uh, tactical, sort of with a focus on, on strategy, uh, military knowledge, and so on. And Zaid Hamid has an incredible background. I really recommend his book, uh, From Indus to Oxus, an account of his uh, participation in the Soviet, the anti-Soviet jihad in Afghanistan, which changed the world. So, hey, it's an honor to welcome you back, Zaid Hamid. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Kevin. It's a pleasure and honor to be with you, brother. So, uh, I, last time I actually saw you in person was at a conference in Iran a few years ago, and you're still as busy as ever, one of the most sought-after and uh, attention-garnering, controversial commentators in Pakistan. So you're the perfect guy to tell us what's really going on with this recent election. Uh, you know, yes, it is. whatever is happening in Pakistan is really complex, and it's making people very confused as to why is that Imran Khan is apparently a liberal, a secular, he used to be a heartthrob of the West. West has actually been projecting him as the future prime minister of Pakistan in the previous elections. So what happened now suddenly that the entire international establishment, which basically means the CIA, the Mossad, and the MI5, and the British intelligence, and even the Indian intelligence, are now after him now. So are they really after him, or the dynamics are much beyond what's visible to the naked eye, as they say? You see, I'll go back slightly, what's happening in the Middle East. The decimation, the destruction, the implosion of the Muslim lands, the decimation of the Muslim country, one after another. There was a report in 2005 by CIA which said by 2015, they would be able to destroy, balkanize Pakistan. And that was the time, if you remember, in 2007, when I actually made my first media appearances and started creating the opinion making and exposing these international conspiracies of balkanization, the Yugoslavia doctrine, which they wanted to apply on these regions. So the democracy was brought in 2007 in Pakistan. And the purpose was that this decade of democracy would basically demolish Pakistan. First, they would bring in Zardari, the Pakistan People's Party, the husband of slain Benazir Bhutto. And he was known as a master crook, even in the country and abroad, even though. So when he shook hands with the British Prime Minister, the British press actually had a headline that British Prime Minister should actually count his fingers, you know, because the man is such a bloody crook. So so after the five years of the People's Party government, the Zadari government, actually destroyed Pakistan economically completely. And the next five years was the complete coup de grace, as they say. Pakistan is totally demolished. We have staggering $100 billion debt upon Pakistan right now. There is, and exports have completely collapsed. The rupee has depreciated 40% in the last one month only. And there's a, and there is a, all the indicators of, of, of a Zimbabwe-style economic collapse you know, are upon us now. We have no foreign exchange reserves to even make the basic imports, maximum month or so week, that's what we have left now. So in this chaos and this crisis, Pakistan army had two options. Option one was to let this so-called democratic process continue. Army did not want it to take over militarily. It made sense also for them, though even though I personally was of a very strong opinion, that we should pause this political process. Army should bring in civilian, technocratic, patriotic people who should stabilize the system, do a ruthless accountability, reform the system, and then we can ignition on, switch on the political system once again. But Army decided that they will go for the elections because third elections were coming. But this time, 
before the elections, about a couple of years before, the accountability process had begun under the supervision of the Supreme Court. And we got, we were lucky to have a very good Supreme Court Chief Justice who took on the mantle of accountability. Right. So the ruling so, so we, so we, we had, we had per, Navarte, corruption, corruption prosecutions. Corruption prosecution, that's true. So the, for the first time in our history, the prime minister of the ruling government was actually jailed while his government was still in place. Yeah? And the process had begun of accountability. So accountability became the main slogan for the Imran Khan's party. He has been very vocal about the accountability process. So when the army decided if they want to continue with the political process and they don't want to take over militarily, it was very natural that the sympathies of the army would be with the Imran Khan's party and not with the previous two People's Party and the Muslim League, Nawaz Sharif and Zardari, who have been robbing the country as if there's no tomorrow. So it's not that the army actually facilitated Imran Khan to come or the rigged the elections. No, it's actually the accountability process against Nawaz Sharif and against Zardari that created the space. When Nawaz Sharif went to jail, huge amount of huge number of his uh, his na- members of National Assembly switched sides and came to the Imran Khan because these people are like, you know, they're like seasonal migratory birds. When they see the elections coming, they shift sides. They see the, whoever is the power side, they move and they move on, they move towards it. So by default, the Imran's party got an advantage. Even though they have not secured the absolute majority, you need 136 seats to form a simple government independently, but they have, they have so far, as the counting is still going on, they have about 115 or 16, so they'll need a coalition. But nevertheless, they are a majority party now. But what the army is going to do now is what they have, it's basically a matter of principle that they have decided is that they are going to fully back up this government, use this government to do the ruthless accountability and the system reforms, and direct this government, advise it, control it, to secure Pakistan's national interest in terms of economy and foreign policy. Now, this is the reason why the international establishment is so upset. They're not upset with Imran Khan per se. They are upset because army has decided to back him up and make the political government deliver. And this is something that's disturbing the Indians, the Americans, and the international press. So, so, so the big time international powers that be are actually afraid that this might actually work, that Pakistan might make progress in fending off this attempt to destroy it. You see, what is happening is that they, Americans are present in Afghanistan. They have created Daesh there. Thousands of Daesh fighters from Middle East and Syria have been transported. So the Americans are waging a brutal war upon us for the last 18 years, like, the same war that they have been waging in Syria against Assad. So, so do, do you think that um, the, do you think the violence uh, in the the bombings during the elections were actually probably sponsored by the Americans who are trying to delegitimize the process? You see, Daesh is an American product. It's a CIA product. Indians were actually dealing with TTP, the local Tehreek e Taliban, Pakistan, the local Taliban who are present in Pakistan. They were the Indian proxies. So the Daesh are actually CIA. And these bombings were not done by TTP. They were done by Daesh. And they're all based in Afghanistan, which is occupied by the Americans. So Americans are completely involved. So, so, so this, this is something that is not Times, even debated in Pakistan. So when the New York Times reports that uh, this, you know, this election was marred by violence and therefore we should consider it a little bit suspect, put an asterisk next to it. Well, it's actually their paymasters that marred the election by organizing the violence, by uh, mobilizing their Daesh assets. You see, the threat is still not over because we know this. Well, Indians are crying hoarse. Indians are in panic. I mean, international establishment is in panic. Then you can hear the Washington Times, New York Times, the Reuters and Guardians and all. They are in it. Hell has broken loose in Pakistan. And what has actually happened is that for the first time, the major political traitors in the Pakistan parliament, the people who were known to be serving the interests of the CIA and India and Afghan intelligence have been kicked out through ballot, through election. And at least a dozen of the top politic, veteran politicians who were known to be political traitors 
have been kicked out by the people finally because of the awareness that came into the people through our work, through our information warfare work, through exposing their crimes, through exposing their links and accesses with Indians and CIA and Afghan intelligence. And so this is actually a bigger crisis now. It's not just that the Imran has come into the power. The old establishment of the CIA and RAW, which were into Pakistani politics, has actually been kicked out through an electoral process. Well, so, so you may not have you may not have to have more Raymond Davis characters. Remember, Raymond Davis was the CIA yes. character who was uh, running around Pakistan, killing people and trying to set up uh, false flag bombings, and he got arrested. And apparently, the Americans had to pay a substantial sum of money to get him shipped back to the United States. Uh, and, and I think that that incident, and then the work you you've been doing, and and that your colleagues have been doing to expose this stuff, really has. <laughs> Awaken the Pakistani people. Do people in Pakistan understand that Daesh is basically an American creation? You see, now for the first time, and I've been doing it, saying it for years and years, but officially Pakistan army was very reluctant to use these terms. But now, just last, just few months ago, officially Pakistan army has started to use the term the fifth generation war or the hybrid war as well with it. You know, and the war, and they have acknowledged the fact that Pakistan is under attack in the same kind of warfare that Yugoslavia was in the 90s and Syria is today. The balkanization through proxy militant terrorist organizations creating an implosion within, attacking the infrastructure, ethnic, linguistic, regional, sectarian wars, igniting it, and then bringing an economic collapse through the appointed political traitors coming into power through the democratic processes. This was the entire axis of the fifth generation war. So. Right. Unless, so this is what Pakistan army realized. They have been, we have been fighting for 15, 16 years on ground. 100,000 casualties we have given trying to push back this the raw and CIA proxy. But still the matter was not being resolved. Why? Because we had a political government which was treacherous. And for the last decade, the political governments were treacherous. So now army has done an experiment. Why I'm saying an experiment is that the team around Imran Khan is equally controversial, naive, and inexperienced. And some of them are actually even dangerous. So while people are seeing the face of Imran Khan, but his advisors, his team around him is absolutely not capable to handle the challenges that Pakistan faces. So that leaves army no choice but to get aggressively involved. Of course, through the think tanks, behind the scenes, there'll not be a martial law. But this government would be very seriously advised, very seriously given a direction. And Imran is known to be a volatile person, a person who, whose, whose opinions have been very, very controversial, even damaging to Pakistan in the past. So it, it has to be made sure that this time he sobers up and he does not utter anything which is detrimental to Pakistan's national security ideology or foreign policy or ethnic, provincial or linguistic the differences that we have in the country. So it's, we are in uncharted waters, to be honest. And I'm not very excited. In fact, I'm anxious. That, and I know the kind of battles we have to fight now. And because we have a very inexperienced team, which is volatile. And we have to get involved very aggressively with them to advise them on how to go ahead. Because the challenges and the crisis that we face, starting up from an economic collapse to urban war to insurgencies and proxy elements and the water wars and the, and the other regional and ethnic frictions that we are facing with the regional and neighboring countries, the challenges are humongous. And for an inexperienced team, if we just leave them alone to do what they feel like doing, would be catastrophic. We can't do that. Yeah, you, you can imagine that Imran Khan might end up uh, facing some of the uh, kinds of situations that have led Donald Trump to do a lot of uh, kind of off the wall things. You know, in both cases, we have people who have a fair bit of ego, who've you know, been in the celebrity spotlight, you know, feeding that ego and who may not know very much about the real details of politics in the strategic equation. And so somebody like Trump, he wants his Nobel Peace Prize. That's his, his dream. So he'll run off to North Korea and he'll be threatening it with annihilation one day and then issuing a, a de facto recognition that, that North Korea is a 
nuclear weapon state the next day, just letting letting them be that. And then he's next thing you know, he's threatening Iran. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, kind of chaotic and unpredictable behavior. Mostly, or a lot of it is driven by Trump's inexperience and his wanting that that peace prize, wanting uh, ego strokes. And with Imran Khan, it looks like he's made a lot of statements that he, you know, he wants to solve the problems by reaching out. He wants to reach out to India, solve the problem with Kashmir. He wants to, you know, reach out to everybody. And uh, he, like Trump, might imagine that, you know, he can succeed with this pure, simple, naive goodwill uh, to, to reach out. And I can understand why if he was not being advised by people who know the real nuts and bolts uh, details and the larger strategic equation – that he could make some disastrous blunders. You see, Imran is an accidental choice. I'll be very honest with you. Accidental choice in the sense given the previous two political parties, the large ones, were all corrupt and have been tested and tried and actually sold out Pakistan completely. What are the choice Pakistan had, Pakistan army had? And, but that doesn't mean that everybody, the patriots, the serious people, the analysts, are comfortable with the mental capacity of Imran. No, they're not. As, and the example of Trump that you gave is exactly, is brilliantly, brilliant, applies on Imran as well. He has never, ever taken any government office before. He's never been into decision-making position for a national government. And he will be facing that role literally in the middle of a heated battlefield for the first time in his life. And his advisors are dangerous. So he needs good advisors. He'll have to come down his ego stairs his, his ivory tower that he has been living in for so long, he has to come down, be humble, take advice from the army. All his life, his rhetoric has been against the army, actually, that once I come into the power, I'll control the army, I'll control the ISI, I will decide what they will do. But unfortunately, in this scenario, he's too inexperienced to say that. And if he tries to do that, he'll actually rock the boat, the national boat, not just the boat of the army or the ISI. So, as I said, we are into uncharted waters. And he will be tested. He will be tried. He will be helped. He will be advised. And opposition to him will be pushed back. Army will do that. We will do that. The patriots will do that. But he has to deliver. He has to stay within. The, the blinders on his eyes have to be very firm. He cannot go left and right. He cannot deviate from the track that is defined. And the track is very clear. National security, national revival, the defense of Pakistan in the face of absolute existential threats. And there's no margin for error here. He's been known to be a playboy all his life. He's been, I mean, he is, he's actually made a joke of himself with his marriages and playboys and, 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 and the, the life that he has in the past. Yeah, another another, Trump, another exactly. Trump parallel. Another Trump attitude, exactly. But now he has to sober up. Now he's got a third wife. She is a very serious lady. She is a very religious lady. She is keeping up. Hopefully, we are hoping that she'll keep Imran in check also. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, so, right. And keep him under control. And, uh, and uh, he would be able to focus more on national issues, the serious national issues, instead of the political sloganeering. Sloganeering is completely a different issue. But when you sit on a chair and start to decide, and you have a button, your finger is on the nuclear button, then you've got to be bloody serious with bloody serious advice. Right. Yeah, I mean, if you have a Trump attitude, you're done. Yeah, yeah. Tr Trump, uh, the, the good side of Trump is it looks like he may be doing uh, some irreparable damage to the interests he's serving. That is, the, you know, ostensibly the U.S. empire and, you know, national power that's, and, and the that's Zionist exactly, entity as well. Uh, that's, to be honest, Kevin, that's exactly I'm afraid about Imran also. Yes. Despite being a good intentioned person, he may cause a repairable damage because of his, because of his inexperience and, and very dangerous advisors. This is precisely what I fear. And that's precisely why the reason I'll get involved with him. I'll advise him. I'll be very harsh critic of him and his party. And they're actually afraid of me. They don't let me come close. But they can't ignore me as well, simply because my opinion matters in this country. So, but I'll keep a very close eye on them. Very, very close. So, so what, what strategy can Pakistan take to fight off this fifth generation warfare attempt to take it down? Uh, it seems that shifting out of the U.S. orbit to a certain extent and uh, moving towards China is one major piece of the puzzle. You see, everything revolved around having a patriotic government in Islamabad. That we never had. 
in the last 10 years. And that's where the maximum damage has been done to us. So this is actually the army's support to PTI and Imran Khan is actually an attempt to bring about somebody at least who is known to be not an open traitor, who is not compromised with the foreign secret, or secret services of foreign governments, maybe naive, stupid, but can be managed. At least he is not anti-Pakistan, you know? Mm. And, and if he is given the right options in front of him, given the right instructions, he can use his influence and power and the charisma that he has in the country and the vote bank to gyrate Pakistan out of the American influence and into more regional blocks and we can develop a better foreign policy that we should be having, which we never had in the last decade, simply because we had absolute corrupt, impro, incompetent, impotent political rascals who had actually compromised Pakistan politically. That, I mean, those political governments were part of the political access of attack on Pakistan. So this, is bring, this election is actually an attempt, is a fight back, is a pushback by Pakistan and Pakistan army against those forces which were attacking through politics. So that's why you find the international establishment in Indians furious. As I said, it's not just that a new government, which is pro-army, has come into power. The old veterans, which were all compromised traitors in the parliament, have also been pushed out through democratic process. So they can't say military has taken over or pushed them out. People have done it. <coughs> right. Uh, so it looks like that this attempt to take down Pakistan, which I think a, a major portion of that was driven by the fear of Pakistan's nuclear weapons. And of course, that's an Israeli preoccupation in the same way they're preoccupied with uh, Iran's nuclear potential, even though it doesn't seem that there really is a whole lot. Uh, they're, of course, even more preoccupied, but perhaps less openly with Pakistan's nuclear potential. But Pakistan needs that, given that that India doesn't has never fully accepted Pakistan's independent existence. And uh, so that that's, of course, a, such a crucial strategic issue. Uh, so how, how do you see Pakistan dealing with this? pressure since the U.S. flipped over to Israel's view and seems to have be playing a long-term game to try to denuclearize Pakistan. See, whatever is happening in Pakistan right now, Kevin, is actually Pakistan's response to exactly these threats that you have just mentioned. The state of Pakistan was imploding through terrorism and through economic collapse and through political treason. Pakistan army has been able to push back, the only army in the world which has actually been able to push back the TTP and the Daesh and the proxy which were sent in from Afghanistan. But army was not involved in politics and nor, and nor it was involved in handling the economy. And those two were exposed flanks. And those exposed flanks were, were sinking the state of Pakistan. So this, we know that. And even for this government, that's the new government that has come up, the biggest challenge would be managing the economy. As I said, $100 billion debt. We don't even have money for imports, let alone paying off the, uh, paying off the, uh, of the interest that we have incurred on these debts. So the crisis is phenomenal. It's staggering. Is, is, there, is there a possibility of debt repudiation? You see, government has to, I mean, if the, if the, the IMF is going to move in and they're going to offer terms and their terms would be, would be backbreaking. And that would actually create civil unrest if the government accepts the IMF terms. So it has to find alternate ways to respond than taking another loan. Um, because if you're not able to pay and there is an unrest, then that creates a justification that creates a case for the Americans that Pakistani nuclear assets are unsafe, backed by the terrorism on ground attacks on the armed forces, our nuclear bases, attacks on the, on the air bases, that creates the justification that nukes are unsafe. So they will do that. We know it. We are entering into very dangerous choppy waters now. And this government will face staggering challenges. Next six months, we'll see whether this government actually survives or not. So I'm not, as I said, too excited about it. But lots of their followers are excited that he's going to be the PM but they don't realize the threats and the challenges and the risks that he's going to face in, in the next few months, probably next six months. Because the enemies are going to attack. They're going to attack economically. They're going to attack in, through international media, perception management, sanctions on Pakistan, and sending in terrorists from Afghanistan, which thousands of them are now basing right next to our border with Afghanistan, on the Afghan side, under the American patronage, CIA is protecting them and launching them. We know it. 
But the government previously could not confront the Americans with that openly because the government was spineless. So let's see if Imran Khan can do that. We'll see. And, and he does know these things. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. You see, the point is he has to be educated because in the past, he had... The whole, he has been resisting military operations against the CIA or raw backed terrorists. He was always against military operations in the tribal areas. <laughs> and in fact, at one time, when the massive bombing was going on in Pakistan by terrorist organization TTP, he actually invited TTP to open their formal office in Peshawar, which is insane. Bizarre. You know? Hmm. So, he has been, as I said, very unpredictable. Very, very unpredictable. And that was precisely the reason I never trusted him. But yeah. uh, now, I guess we have no choice. I guess, we have I guess, to advise him. <laughs> it looks like Pakistan has a slightly yeah. more attractive version of Donald Trump. Uh, let's hope it works out better than Trump is working out for the U.S. Uh, I really hope so. I really <laughs> hope so. Because Trump, yes, when he will leave, he'll definitely going to destroy the American empire. And, uh, and, and that I have no doubt about it. Like Modi, Narendra Modi in India, his Hindu Zionism, his fascism, his extremism is actually disintegrating the Indian society. You know, and another term to them, and India is finished as a secular state, it will become, it will persecute, destroy, decimate its own population, the Dalits, the untouchable, the Christians, the Jews, the Muslims, Sikhs. India will disintegrate at the hands of their own fanatic leader. So I really hope, I really hope that Imran behaves more sanely listens to the army, listens to the patriots, come down from his high horse and, and become more humble. Start listening to good advisors, not to the advisors he has now around him. Leaving him alone would be dangerous. Well, that, that question of advisors is important, as, as we see with Trump uh, having Bolton and Pompeo around him. But we, I think we've hit the end of the hour, the half hour, rather. So thank you so much, Zayed Hamid. I look forward to bringing you back in the not-too-distant future, inshallah, and talking a little bit more about where this is all heading and maybe getting an assessment. You're on, welcome, on Kevin, and, and we hope to see you in better times. Take care, my friend. Okay, take care. Kind of. You take, take care of yourself. Okay. Goodbye.